Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Global Agenda at the University of Delaware. I'm Ralph Begleiter. Welcome also to our guests participating online on Second Life. Tonight is the last of this year's Global Agenda programs, so I have to take care of a little business before we get started. It has been a privilege again to put this program together. I'm always in awe working with an outstanding class of students who have explored, in this case, our wide array of climate change topics, from the science and the technology to diplomacy to energy policy, the politics of climate change. I want to personally thank the World Affairs Council of Wilmington and the University of Delaware for their continuing support for Global Agenda. Thanks to UD's Center for International Studies, the Department of Political Science and International Relations, the Department of Communication, and the Department of Fine Arts and Visual Communications, which all pitch in to bringing this series to the university each year. As I was scheming up topics for this year's series, people kept asking me why I included a topic like tonight's, the national security implications of climate change. I know our guest tonight will amplify and amply explain why the US military and intelligence community is concerned about climate change, and naturally, I don't want to steal any of our speaker's thunder. I'm sure he'll make the connection between the horrible cyclone disaster in Myanmar we've seen in just the past week and the involvement of US military forces in Southeast Asia in relief efforts there. But another little noticed news item was a gift to me tonight, illustrating a more subtle national security connection to climate change. The number two leader of Al Qaeda, the Egyptian Ayman al Zawahiri, issued a fresh audio tape a couple of weeks ago. He used the tape to send out answers to some 900 questions posed to him and posted through extremist jihadist websites last December. On the two-hour audio tape, Zwahiri predicted that global warming, quote, would make the world more sympathetic to and understanding of the Muslims' jihad against the aggressor America, unquote. Zwahiri's answers are being cataloged and studied by military scholars at West Point. Weeks before the audio tape, Zwahiri offered written answers to more questions. As reported by NPR, one of the questions addressed to Al-Qaeda was, quote, how do you feel about the issue of global warming and what effect it might have on the current fighting against Islam, unquote. Zwahiri's written answer, quote, the environmental catastrophes which will be caused by the failure of America and the West to take effective measures to stop the release of poisonous gases that cause this high temperature will convince the peoples of the world, God willing, of the extent of the criminality, avarice, and barbarism of the Western crusader world led by America." Unquote. In other words, some Islamist leaders are using the high carbon emissions of the United States as yet another battering ram to persuade jihadist followers that the U.S. is evil. And if that's not a national security connection to the issue of climate change, I don't know what else is. Our guest tonight is someone you don't see or talk to very often. He works for the National Intelligence Council, part of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, which oversees the CIA and all other U.S. spy agencies. Major General Rich Engel has been an intelligence analyst for the CIA since 2000, mostly studying things like technology and their effect on military strategy for the U.S. In a previous life, as a U.S. Air Force officer, he commanded the Flight Test Center at Edwards Air Force Base, California, where he directed the development, test, and evaluation of both manned and unmanned aircraft systems the testing of experimental and research aerospace vehicles and parachute systems. General Engel was commissioned through the Reserve Officer Training Corps at Texas A&M University, where he earned a BS in mechanical engineering. He also has an MS from Arizona State and an MA in National Security Strategic Studies from the Naval War College in Rhode Island. While he was in the Air Force, General Engel was a command pilot and accumulated more than 4,000 flying hours in more than 30 different aircraft. He flew 150 combat missions during the Vietnam War. Please welcome General Richard Engel to the University of Delaware.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First question you should ask is, what is an experimental test pilot talking about global climate change for? I've asked myself that question several times, but I will tell you the, this particular journey has been a, a fascinating journey for me, as we have, within the uh, intelligence community, begun a relatively broad look at how climate change may indeed uh, affect our national security. Let's see if my toy here works. This is the red button that starts World War III. Okay, that's the one that advances it. Okay, I got it. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is uh, kind of give you a little bit of an overview of, of the topic of national security and global climate change. I will start, and I, well, I'll frame my remarks pretty much around a document that we are currently preparing called a National Intelligence Assessment of Climate Change. I'll go through a little bit of an overview that kind of shows you what I'd like to talk about tonight. I'll talk about how we got into this using something we call the National Intelligence Priorities Framework. Uh, a lot, very, very briefly, I guess, one slide on outreach, because this is a particular kind of topic that we don't inherently have the skill set within the intelligence community to look at, and I'll show you how we've kind of gone out of the community to help us understand the issue. Then I'll give you one caveat, which essentially says that everything I say is not really my opinion, it's other people's opinion, and my opinion I won't give you tonight, okay? So that's what the caveat says. And you'll see the, the bulk of my remarks tonight are really devoted to what other people have told us. They kind of lay the stage for you and help you give us some background so you can see where global climate change potentially is a national security topic. And then finally, I'll come back to the national intelligence assessment just with about three charts to kind of put the... Uh, put the discussion of what I say in terms of what other people have told us in context of how we're trying to answer this question for the policy community within the United States government. Okay, so the overall objective is to give you background today on a national intelligence assessment of the national security ramifications of global climate change. I have to begin a little bit by talking about what the difference is between a national intelligence assessment and a national intelligence estimate. You've probably all heard of uh, famous NIC NIEs, those are national intelligence estimates. Sometimes we get it wrong. <coughs> Iraq, WMD, mm, what can I say? Uh, but there is a difference between an NIE and an NIA. They are both at the highest level of products we produce. The intelligence council, National Intelligence Council has a responsibility of integrating insights from across the intelligence elements of within the United States government and producing what we call community products that reflect the combined opinion of the community. The highest level we do is a national intelligence estimate and a national intelligence assessment. Both of those documents are reviewed by the National Intelligence Board, which consists of all the senior heads of agencies, the Director of Central Intelligence and the Director of Defense Intelligence Agency and, and so forth, and they put their stamp of approval on these documents. The difference between an NIE and an NIA is both one of time, scope, and one of how should I say this, confidence or definitive character of the analysis that we do. NIEs typically are focused about five to seven years out in the future. They're, they tend to be very, very singular in topic oriented. Is this guy going to develop an ASAT program? Is this guy going to invade this country? How strong is the military in this country? Things like that. They are, as the E stands for, estimative in terms of we try to build upon specific facts and make judgments about what we think is going to happen, but they are shorter in their time horizon. National intelligence assessments typically have a longer view. In other words, they go out and look at a longer period of time. They are a little bit more speculative because of the longer time element, time horizon associated with them, and therefore they're, they're, they're a different kind of document. Uh, they are, however, reviewed by the same process that's used for an NIE. They're approved by all the same leaders. And we have this cute little thing we do in the intelligence biz business where when we produce these products, if someone doesn't agree with it, they get to write a footnote. So if, if the whole community says the sky is blue but the CIA thinks it's red, we'll have a little footnote in there and says CIA thinks it's red. So when we produce these kind of documents, uh, organizations are provided the privilege of, of adding footnotes. And as uh, those of you who've read the declassified version of the NIE on uh, Iraq, you saw there were lots of footnotes where different agencies had different opinions. I'm happy to say that so far, so far, in this National Intelligence Assessment of Climate Change, the footnotes are really uh, rather limited, which is good. So how did we get into this? 
Uh, we have within the intelligence community a framework which basically defines the types of things that we look at when we prepare documents for the policy portions of the U.S. government. Uh, this National Intelligence Priorities Framework has about 20 different topics in it. They are prioritized in terms of things we ought to look at. And every six months, we have a gather a meeting of all the members of the community, representatives from each of the organizations, and we go over these topics and we say, okay, what should we concentrate on in the coming six months? What did we not look at last time? What do we need to spend more time looking at? What do we ask our collectors? What should we try and focus our collection activity? That's all called the National Intelligence Priorities Framework. Uh, the National Intelligence Council with the NIOs kind of uh, champions the conduct of much of that. There is a topic, as I said, there are about 20 of them. One of them is a topic called environment and natural resources. If you read the fine print down there, you can see where climate is indeed part of that topic. In November of 2006, we were having one of these uh, every six month meetings and the group of us looked at this topic and said, you know, we think climate change is approaching the point where we probably ought to uh, bring it up to the agenda and do an intelligence report on it. And we, we started the process to develop an intelligence community product. Uh, we got a little help along the way. We briefed um, the Center for Naval Analysis, some senior military officers that were doing a study, and they told us, they said, you guys ought to elevate that and make it an NIE. We kind of said, well, NIE is the wrong document, but okay, we hear you. Then the Congress got engaged, and the Congress prepared some draft legislation, bipartisan draft legislation that said, National Intelligence Council, thou wilt go and do a national intelligence estimate. So recognizing that this was obviously an issue that was growing in the political agenda, we did elect to elevate our product and indeed started down the path that really began in November of 2006 to develop a national intelligence assessment on global climate change and what it means for national security. And that has led us to where we are today. Let me talk a little bit about the outreach. As I said, uh, this was a very fascinating topic, and this is one of the things that made it, uh, to me, just really rewarding to go do. Uh, intelligence community, we have our usual sources. You know, we steal stuff, we got spies, you know, all the stuff you read about, and James Bond and everything does so well. But um, this one was really different. All of our typical clandestine sources of information really were not of value to answering this question. Because the first question we had to answer is, if I got to determine climate change is going to be a national security question, the first issue is, how is the climate going to change? And to that, we really depend upon the open source scientific community to give us some help. So we went to a group of organizations, which I've got listed on the slide, and asked each of them to do some kind of reports for us. In some cases, we contracted with them. In other cases, we read works that they had otherwise done. And we used this body of research to help us wrap our hands around how we were going to approach looking at the question of national security and uh, global climate change. Um, and I want to point out just two that uh, several, I guess, that were very important. The Joint Global Change Research Institute is a partnership between the Department of Energy, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and the University of Maryland. And they helped us with writing the Science Scene Center. Another critical organization was the Center for International Earth Science and Information from Columbia University. When we looked at this question, a lot of what has been written has been written at the very macro level, global atmospheric models, but not at the specific state level. So we asked CSEN from Columbia University to go out and give us some state-specific data because we needed that data if we were going to determine state-specific impacts from a national security point of view. And they did some original research uh, for us, and I'm sure that when the NIA is finally finished, that research will probably be made available in the public domain for folks to, uh, to, folks to look at. And I'll talk about some things Global Business Network showed us, and eventually then after we had all the science defined, we, we took a step, and I'll kind of go through this process, where we brought a group of outside political and social experts. In other words, we got the science first, then we got a group of political and social experts. We said, okay, you tell us what you think this means. And they gave us their assessment of what they thought was going to happen in various countries. And then based upon that, we went into our rooms, closed our little top secret doors, and we wrote our own opinions of what we thought was really going to happen. Okay, so that's kind of the process we used, and I'll explain that a little bit more when I get to it. Okay, so here's my giant caveat. What I'm going to tell you in the next bunch of slides is what we have been told. Uh, it reflects the views of outside experts. It's not necessarily endorsed by the U.S. government or the intelligence community. And one of the challenges we faced was a lot of this material was written for different audiences in different time frames. We, 
we had a relatively narrow desire to look only out to 2030. If you want to know why, I'll explain that a little bit in the Q&A. But we restricted ourselves to 2030. So we had to take this body of, of public research that had been done and kind of filter through it to see, well, what, what part of it really only applies to 2030. And much of the material we, we, uh, I'll go over with you does, does, however, provide insight into current expert views. And we tried as much as we could to really use peer-reviewed uh, literature. And we counted on uh, the University of Maryland and the North Pacific Northwest National Laboratory to help us sort through material, make sure what we were looking at was, was peer-reviewed. Before I get into this, one, <laughs> one other quick uh, caveat. We relied heavily upon the Intergovernmental Panel uh, climate change, IPCC, fourth assessment report. Why did we do that? That report has been coordinated on by the U.S. government. So the science contained in that report essentially reflected at some level a coordinated U.S. government position. Intelligence community doesn't have a bunch of climate experts. We didn't want to go reinvent climate science. We wanted to get a good description of what might happen that we could use, hence we used that material which had already been coordinated on by the U.S. government. So that was kind of our, our, our logic. Uh, and that was, it turned out to be very, very interesting. Okay, so what have people told us? Uh, climate change poses unique challenges to U.S. national security and interest. And most of these, by the way, as you really look at it, eventually get to the point of state stability. You, you end up with a climate change that you put on top of some other factor that's going on inside a state and you end up one way or another challenging the state stability. And then the question is, does that state stability, if it becomes unstable, manifest itself in a national security way to the United States? That can happen because it provides a sanctuary. The state actually fails and provides a sanctuary to terrorists, as uh, was alluded to with many failed states that could go do that, particularly if, the, if a climate change message like that resonates with broad po populations. The other observation that came to us was that many of the approaches to look at this are really, quite frankly, uh, fraught with some analytical challenges. And I'll kind of show you why that happens, but it has to do with the way one actually intellectually walks through climate change all the way through to looking at whether or not it's going to have a specific impact from a national security point of view. What parts of national security could this affect? As I said, principally it has to do with state failure but there's core security concerns related to things that directly happen. There's indirect security concerns because it happens to an ally or an economic partner or someone that we count to or puts at risk an energy source that's important to us. Foreign policy concerns because people have perceptions about the United States and, and every weather event is seen as potentially a symbol of climate change and who's the biggest enemy of climate change? The United States. So therefore, we're in the unenviable position of potentially every adverse weather event is blamed on us because it's attributed to climate change. Although the climate scientists will swear to you that you can't really do that. Nonetheless, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to take place in uh, geopolitics when it does happen. And then finally, the last point on that slide is important. If you do see climate change hit states with such an impact that the state itself starts to crumble and citizens lose value, lose confidence in the state, it could result in uh, a situation where a state it becomes so inwardly focused because its citizens are looking at someone else, looking at uh, their own problems that they can't do anything externally. Okay, uh, why is it important? Um, it poses novel problems for us in terms of how to act. It puts new kinds of cost requirements for us in terms of preemptive action. Again, as was alluded to in the introductory remarks, you know, the U.S. Department of Defense wants to respond to a humanitarian crisis whenever these occur around the world. We, we feel an obligation to do that if the scope and quantity of these increase so much as a result of climate change in the future, we could find ourselves in a set of circumstances where the military is literally stretched thin with humanitarian and unable to support its own combat support and combat uh, service support, which is necessary for combat operations. What are some of the challenges? Let me take a couple slides now to talk about the challenges. Uh, first and foremost, climate change is, is kind of a first order geophysical effect. And, but that's not where it stops. It, just because of its first order effect, it is not a national security issue. You have to go through a series of steps before it really comes to be a national security issue. Here's the challenge. The scientific community has excellent global atmospheric models 
to describe the global atmospheric impact of climate change, especially for temperature. They will tell you their models for precipitation are not, not as good. But if you go away from the global view and you try and say what is this going to mean in a specific country or a specific region of a country, the science is not yet developed at that level. That, that doesn't mean it's not a problem. It just means when we're trying to look at something from a national security point of view, we need a broader view, we need a more specific view than this broader global view. The example I, I like to use is you can imagine a one degree temperature change in Southern California or a 1.5 degree temperature change by 2030 or something like that. Well, it makes a huge difference if that temperature change occurs on one side of the mountains where the San Joaquin Valley is and all the agriculture for California is done or the other side of that mountain where crazy test pilots are out flying F F-16s and the Mojave Desert's there. One degree more, the Mojave Desert doesn't make that much difference, but it makes a huge difference to agriculture. So having the specific specificity of this is very important to what we want to do, but yet at the same time, it's very, very hard to do. And if you go from trying to go from the broader picture all the way down to the national security, then you can see some of the challenges you face to do it. Let me kind of walk you through this one slide. I, as I said, at the bottom of there, they kind of, this was actually done by Global Business Networks. It actually got five different steps you got to go through. The lower level really talks about the global models. Then you get the geophysical models. That's going to have some biological impact, but you have to have the specificity to predict that. That's going to have an impact on human beings. The human beings then collectively, a group, will react some way. And then, there, then you get to the point of evaluating the national security. So you've got kind of five, the logic trail there is you've got five steps you've got to go through to figure out what the national security impact is. Now, if you have a certain degree of uncertainty in each of those five steps, well, then by the time you get to the end, you've got this cumulative uncertainty, which means it's very, very hard to credibly predict what the national security issue is going to be. And so this one particular study kind of summarized it all with this bottom line is, the where's, when's, how's of climate change remain both unknowable and no, unknowable because of this uncertainty from a national security point of view. Well, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't quit and not look at the issue. I mean, that was just one of the, uh, the logic problem we faced in trying to go through this in a linear way. So they, they gave us an alternate point of view. They said, instead of approaching this linearly, where you start with the geophysical, you go through the biophysical, you go through the you know, humans and then the, how humans react as a group and then the national security. Look at it the other way around. Start at a state vulnerability perspective. Pick the areas that are important to you. Look at their inherent vulnerabilities and then consider the contribution that climate change will make on top of what is already an inherently uh, potentially at-risk system. That does indeed simplify the five-step logic path. But it presents its own set of challenges because who's to say the unstable state in 2008 is the unstable state I'm going to see in 2030? So you, you're left with how do I want to carry my uncertainty through the logic? Do I, do I carry it through those five steps or do I make the assumption that the same states that are of interest to me today will be the same states that are of interest to me in 2030 and that they will be equally as vulnerable as 2030 as they are today? That, quite frankly, is a, is a challenge. Nonetheless, we, we tried to step up to it and, and did the best we could to, to look at this. We did do a combination of really both approaches when we did this assessment. In some cases, we looked at unstable states, added the contribution. In other cases, we kind of walked our way through the, uh, through the logic trail. As, uh, as pointed out, that second approach really does invert the normal way you do it, and it's kind of not the way analysis would typically be done, but it does indeed uh, recognize the unique challenge of what we face. Let me talk about uh, what we've been told about some of the specific uh, changes that are in front of us. Generally, the uh, Earth's climate is changing. It has always been changing, so that's not a blind, anything but a blinding flash of the obvious. But the recent trends clearly say we're, we're getting warmer, and some of the recent trends have accelerated, and the scientific community remains very convinced that this acceleration is in part contributed to by uh, greenhouse gases, in part contributed to by human burning of fossil fuels. So we, we see some manifestations of that. Temperatures in the Arctic are rising almost twice as fast as they are in other parts of the world. We have had more heavy uh, precipitation events uh, over, over a period of time, although I will tell you, when you ask them and you really dig into the IPCC data, 
Uh, we really wanted to understand extreme weather events because they're very important as they potentially put at risk infrastructure. And in the United States, it's a huge issue because we have infrastructure that has historically been at, at risk from about the mid-Atlantic states down around the Gulf Coast. But if the frequency and intensity of storms due to climate change is to migrate up further north the Atlantic, we have more valuable infrastructure that potentially is at risk, some of which is not prepared for that kind of an issue. Here, the, client, the science community, as we have understood what they've told us, has said this. They feel with very high confidence they can talk about the fact that storm intensity will increase because the water is warm and they have plenty of experience that warmer water leads to more severe storms, more intense storms. Let me, yeah, more intense storms. On the question of frequency, they are not so sure because frequency is a more complex problem driven in part by surface winds and driven in part by global circulation patterns. So therefore, we may have storms that are more intense, but we may not have them at more frequency. On the other hand, some recent observations would lead you to believe we have indeed seen increases in frequency. So the science on that particular issue is still kind of out there. Some regions which are already vulnerable to uh, drought, Indonesia, northwestern Brazil, southwestern United States, and parts of Africa and Australia are now experiencing more frequent droughts and more severe droughts. And if you look at what they project in the future, they anticipate that would, uh, that would continue. Permafrost is a fascinating topic because, as I said, it's warmer up north, and so some of the permafrost is melting. And one of the hard things to wrap our hands around that problem from a national security point of view is the good news is to states that have oil or energy resources up to the north, Canada and Russia, you might say off the top of your head, well, they, these guys are going to be winners because of the melting permafrost. It'll be easier for them to get up to. However, other people will say, you know, that permafrost is really going to just turn into mud. And quite frankly, ability to pull those resources out is going to be harder because it's melting. Further, if you do have infrastructure, pipeline infrastructure, cities, that you've built on permafrost that you thought was going to be solid and now it starts melting, you could have very expensive replacement and repair costs associated with trying to literally redo the foundations. So the permafrost story is a mixed story, but, but generally speaking, uh, some people have tried to principally inform us of the fact they think it's going to be a, a challenge. OK, so what are some of the regional trends? One slide to talk about the regional trends of 2030, and then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about 2100, explain why we did that, and then I'll get into the most controversial thing you wrote in the paper, uh, and I'll tell you why it was controversial. OK, regional trends to 2030. Uh, we, are see, we anticipate, according to the IPCC and what people have told us, we will see ecosystems affected, human systems affected in, in complex ways. In some cases, China, climate change may be rapid, and the rapid changes may call degradation of agricultural productivity, and we may see pests and disease move on paths and vectors that we have not seen before. Low-lying coastal areas, while probably will not be challenged by sea level rise directly, because the sea level rise in 2030, according to the IPCC, is really quite small, 75 millimeters in the, in the mainline estimate. But what you may see is if you see more intense storms, you may see storm surges bring more water across to the coastline and do more damage. So you may have more damage caused by storm surges. But the actual sea level rise itself is to be relatively small. Even if it is small, sea level rise, if it raises the water up just a little bit and the energy of a more intense storm can put more damage ashore, and you have coastal areas that are developing parts of the world with very large populations and not necessarily well prepared to handle them, then you, can have, you can have horrendous uh, humanitarian disasters, as we often witness around. <coughs> well, witness. <coughs> when we looked at 2100 and beyond, and I won't go through the litany of all the scenarios that uh, the IPCC does, but we did use some of their scenario work to kind of evaluate this. The first question is, you said the report was to 2030, Rich. Why are you looking at 2100? We think as 2030 approaches, the people in the world will start to look at what their future is like, and they'll be very sensitive to the predictions out to 2100. Although they will not yet have manifest, they will start to be sensitive to them as they are. They will start to demand certain actions and uh, political actions, both locally and internationally, and therefore it can have national security impacts for us. So we think the, the vision from 2025, if you will, looking out towards 2030 is important because it will influence the way states, states react. If you look at the scenarios, uh, 
many of the scenario challenges brought forth show significant changes in precipitation over the next 25 years, and with that come significant changes in, in agriculture. The models and theory used uh, expect the severe storms, both tropical storms as well as tropical cyclones, will become more intense as we find the increasing temperatures, particularly increasing temperatures associated with the water. However, the number of storms, as I said, the science remains out and how that really is going to take place. Uh, during this century, most of what we, what we would see probably would be a degradation in agriculture, particularly if we see it rise above about three degrees from a global temperature. It could be significant, but certainly even small changes in agriculture in certain specific spots of the world could result in degradation. On the other hand, <laughs> this is, uh, I've learned a new phrase in this study, uh, and the new phrase is, this is really complicated. <laughs> On the other hand, um, we've tried to say, okay, who might be winners? So you, you say, okay, temperature rises a little bit, one or two degrees. Canada and Russia are winners. Uh, increased temperature means longer growing season, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, helps to fertilize plants, you get some plant growth. Uh, warmer temperature to states that are basically on the north, very north, means they have uh, reduced heating bills. So all, sounds good to me, not so fast. Uh, if you look at Canada by itself, you might not be able to take advantage of the warmer temperature because the soil may not allow you to do it. You may not be able to expand the growing area because you have trees and other things that you don't want to chop down for environmental, very legitimate environmental reasons. So just because it's warmer doesn't mean you can take advantage of the fact that it may be warmer. And then you look at bugs. I mean, uh, Canadians are at risk of significant loss to some of their uh, forest industry because of beetles that would normally die because it was cold, now may live longer and put some significant forests at risk. So is Canada a winner? Well, it, as I said, it, when you look at that, it becomes a little bit more complicated to try and sort out. I would say the Canadian government is not quite so sure that's, that's the case. <laughs> oh, we, we are going to see some glacier and ice melts, and this is... Uh, this is important because water is one of the major things we have been told, again, we've been told, not my opinion, one of the major things we've been told will affect security in the future. And we're almost getting set up, the world is almost getting set up. Glaciers melt, so you get a lot of water runoff. People think water is readily available. Then the warm temperature really continues to quit, kick in. The glacier's no longer there to melt because it's gone and now you have water scarcity from a previous perhaps 20 or 30 year period where you had a water abundance. So you could see a very radical shift in water availability that we've been warned about. And if this occurs in some places around the world, it could result in significant uh, instability of migration. And migration is one of the major issues that from a national security point we're sensitive to because as people migrate, how are they going to be received? They're going to be received constructively or destructively inside their own country or between countries, and what will that mean in terms of the way these states uh, react? Okay, um, the next portion uh, talks about how we could be overestimating and underestimating. We felt it important as we looked at this document or looked at this question, we took a middle-of-the-road IPCC scenario, A1B, out to 2030 as kind of a baseline for us to think about, although we used some other data. Basically, we took middle-of-the-road. Um, we felt it was important to tell the policy community, because there, there are some uncertainties associated with this, we could have it wrong in terms of it could be a lot worse, or we could have it wrong, it potentially could be not as bad. So we wanted to provide a balanced view of both sides of those, and I think I have about four slides that show that. I will tell you that was the most difficult part of our document to write. Getting it, saying it could be potentially be worse was easy. Everyone was willing to tell us how it could be worse. Saying it potentially might not be as bad was a, was a, uh, a very uh, controversial um, exercise. Because to those who believe, if you even hint it may not be as bad, you are a heretic of the first order. <laughs> so even trying to put the slightest bit of, uh, this might not be as bad as you think, in there, uh, people really got very upset with us. Uh, by the way, don't think inside the intelligence community we are any different than the rest of this country. 
we've got people who are just trying to analytically do their main line. We've got people who believe one and people who believe another. So, uh, but in the end, the good news about the way we put these reports together is we beat all those extremists up and we, we tend to go right to the wishy-washy middle. <laughs> Okay, so what might, what might happen to really make this whole, go a whole lot worse than we thought? Uh, first of all, we have observed uh, significant quick changes in the climate, and scientists wanted us to be aware of that. Uh, we've seen it before. We've seen abrupt changes in the circulation of the oceans, that particularly that warm Europe. That would get Europe's attention. Uh, right now, we've seen some uh, uh, glacial melts and some Ant West Antarctic and, and Greenland ice sheet melts that appear to be faster than what we previously had predicted, although we're not sure how that's all gonna sort through. Uh, and we have seen cases of where we may have abrupt conversions of vegetation, and we've certainly seen, some people would argue, acidification of the ocean with carbon dioxide that could be very, very bad for us. So the collapse of the ice sheets, according to our scientists, was probably the greatest single thing in the next 30 years that may cause us uh, a real surprise. Uh, now, what would, uh, what would cause us to, uh, one more slide on, on uh, underestimating. Many studies have really looked at this as a probability distribution of future temperatures, but they found much longer, if you look at the way they do that, you got a distribution of temperatures, they got a much longer tail on the, it's gonna be bad side than the, it's gonna be good side. So while you may pick this type of your distribution to be in, you've got to be recognized, and this was the point that why it could be worse, is if you looked at all the data, the data does tend to give you a bias towards it could be worse, and that's the, that's the point that they wanted to leave us. Okay, how could we be overestimating the future of climate change? Well, are there feedback mechanisms that, that might counteract the, the planet's warming? And... Uh, one of the ones that's been suggested that uh, uh, is potentially as you get a warming in the, in the tropical areas, you get moisture comes off the ocean, it forms clouds, and the clouds themselves stop some of the sun's energy from coming into the planet. Is that potentially a feedback mechanism that could stop global warming? The other thing is, could we potentially have the climate sensitivity number wrong in the first place? The, the number at which a, uh, a doubling of... Uh, of CO2, degrees rise that occurs with the doubling of carbon dioxide, right? I think the IPCC numbers are actually 1.7 to right around 4.4 right now. And, but some people think, you know, that, that could be wrong. It, it could be, if it's less than 1.7, if it's toward the 1.7 area, then this problem will not be as, as bad as we think it is. However, if it's higher than 4.4, close to 5.5, then we could be in for a really rough ride. Uh, the scientific data, again, has a real hard time acknowledging that it's going to be anything less than, than that range. Finally, uh, what is fertilization going to do? Is it possible that from a feedback mechanism that we get more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, plants like carbon dioxide, we'll see more plant growth, that will absorb more carbon dioxide, and we'll literally pull the carbon dioxide out of the planet because of plant growth. Scientists say, well, it sounds good, but when you really look at the carbon cycle, they're not so optimistic that's really going to take place, and therefore, they don't hold that out to have much hope. As I said, writing this part, why could it not be as bad, was really a hard, hard thing for us to do. Okay, let me, uh, let me kind of give you a little capsule summary of why this might be a national security concern. As expressed, again, I'm giving you opinion as expressed to us. Water is a big deal. Water, because it affects humans and it creates uh, scarcity and, and humans... Uh, need that water, when they don't have it, they feel fundamentally their life is threatened. The second thing is water affects agriculture, and particularly vulnerable are those parts of the world that depend upon subsistence agriculture, where they can't use technology to compensate for, for an absence of the natural water. Uh, in addition to that, you, you have the fundamental impact on agriculture itself. As I said before, that's complicated because temperature should increase, carbon dioxide available should help grow up to a certain point. And if you look at the actual research, small changes according to the research, some of which are done in laboratory kind of settings, give you the impression that small changes in more carbon dioxide is not bad for agriculture. However, the community is, scientific community is less than convinced that's really the case. And for all the reasons I talked about the soil in Canada and other things, they say that may be a whole lot more complicated than you think. Now, why those two are really together important because they lead to migration. 
I mean, if you find yourself in a subsistence situation or in a water scarcity situation, human beings are probably going to move. If the human beings move, how will they be received when they move? From a national security point of view, if they move into inside their own state and it's an ethnic homogeneous state and they're well accepted, that's probably not a problem. If they move in an ethnically diverse state, e either because of uh, religion or other things, and they are rejected, now you have a state stability issue. And if that state becomes unstable and it's a key ally of the United States or it holds a critical resource that we're interested in, now it's a national security issue. And if they have to migrate out of their state to another state, how will they be received? Again, same types of issues come into play. A lot of migration caused by climate change could be very destabilizing around the world and could have significant national security concerns. At least that's what we, we've been told. Uh, last two bullets, uh, where could this be national security? Or, or important especially for the developed world, I guess. One of them is the, is the question of infrastructure. We have a lot of valuable coastal infrastructure. In the United States, we do. Uh, so, does, so does China on the eastern coast of China. And if this infrastructure becomes at risk because of changes in storm patterns or intensities that happen, remember I said that this change in storm patterns was not guaranteed, you end up with a set of circumstances where you could have some very valuable infrastructure gets clobbered. And uh, if it gets, what does it mean when my infrastructure design criteria is no longer valid? I've designed my city on the assumption that I'm going to get a storm once every 100 years, and now I see that storm once every three years. And what does it mean if my climate is dynamically changing so that I have to, not only does my infrastructure design criteria have to be adjusted for where I am, it has to dynamically adjust as I see the climate potentially change in front of me. So infrastructure design criteria, particularly for the developed world where you have valuable infrastructure, is something that we have to think about. And I talked about the melting permafrost. The final thing is perception and leadership. People have told us, and I'll get to this a little bit, uh, matter of fact, in the next slide, uh, where the geopolitical fault line is going to be. <laughs> the key uncertainty when we talk, when people talk to us, they say, is the United States. What's the United States going to do? We, uh, we are a huge actor in this uh, environment. We have, uh, people have told us, we have significant leadership ability to influence. We sit kind of between, uh, as a developed, well-developed country, we sit kind of between Europe, who has a certain view of very aggressive reduction in the developing world, which is not so sure they want to pay the price of that, well, the United States could be a bridge and do some uh, significant leadership activity. That's been suggested to us by people who've helped us look at this. What do we see from the international politics? You've got some fault lines, some fault lines that are not classical uh, fault lines from a national security point of view, but nonetheless have national security ramifications. North and South Europe is going to experience different, different things. Different parts of Asia will experience different advantages or disadvantages from it. The United States and Europe, as I said, from the developing world. And finally, the United States and China, because uh, obviously we want China to do a lot to help in this area, and China may not be so excited about doing that. Is there likely to be a global consensus? Outside experts have told that so that really depends upon the United States. And uh, depend on whether or not that is effective or not effective will have to, have to do with the global consensus. And of course, you know, um, something else people have said, and this, this, this shouldn't come as any great shock, but if you are perceived in a leader in constructive leadership in one area, sometimes you can reach over and ask for favors in another area and it makes a difference. If you're perceived as obstinate in one area, any country, and I don't speak in the United States any particular example, but any country, if you're perceived as obstinate in one area and you want to call favors in another area, you may have a harder time pulling that off. So reputation is important, and this is an issue that will probably affect, uh, as, we've been, as we've been told, it will probably affect reputation of anyone who tries to lead it or not lead it. Okay, let me, uh, three slides and I'll get off the stage. Uh, let me talk about the national intelligence assessment itself. That's all what we've been told, by the way, what people have told us. Um, we are going to do this national intelligence assessment. It is targeted at the, at the unclassified level. That's what the Congress asked us to do. I will tell you that as we got more and more into this, keeping it unclassified has been harder and harder to do. Uh, not because of the classical intelligence reasons of sources and methods, but because, I mean, our goal was not to just deliver another document that had to do with themes, uh, which I've given you abundance of in the very absence of specificity. 
not by design, not by accident. Um, but we didn't want to deliver another document that was just thematic. We wanted to really get down to something that would potentially be actionable by the policy community. So we had to get very specific. And as you, the more specific you get, two challenges arise. One, because of the science, as I said, it's hard to do that. And number two, well, it becomes awkward for us to go publicly and, you know, admit that the, you know, Klingon Empire is going to be wiped out by an absence of dilithium crystals or something. You know, we just don't want to get in that business of trying to explain what's going to happen in other parts of the world and have our ambassadors called in, they get yelled at, and then they call us and they yell at us and say, why did you say that? You know, so bottom line, it's being hard to keep this as an uh, unclassified document. Mostly because it, uh, as I said, of its specificity and it, it would frustrate the execution of, of U.S. Uh, foreign policy. We did start this based upon uh, the NIPS topic review, and we also, as I indicated, got some help from Congress. Uh, so, what did, how do we define national security? Uh, this is, uh, without going into a big long dissertation, this definition, which is actually from the report, uh, talks about defining it in the context of interest level, and that reflects the major interest level, talks about all the elements of national power potentially coming into play. And then we talked about how paths, how climate change may affect these elements of power, and if it affected them, why we trigger that, at least at the interest level, to consider a national security issue. Obviously, a direct effect on the U.S. homeland. If climate change manifests itself in a way that it affects a major military ally or affects a major U.S. economic partner, or because the impact is so large that the resulting humanitarian issue puts a burden on the United States wanting to respond that actually consumes our resources, particularly consumes our uh, national security resources. So how did we approach this? As I said, we did research. We developed the scientific scene center for this. We requested state-specific data, and I mentioned we got that from the Center for International Earth Science Information Network from uh, Columbia University. And this was, this was kind of the breakthrough analytical part of this is they actually gave us state-specific data on water vulnerability, water, I'm sorry, climate vulnerability, which they defined as temperature rise divided by state coping capacity as a broad relative index of, of vulnerability. They gave us information on water scarcity, and they gave us information on potential sea level rise. The one meter sea level rise data, which is the highest resolution they could give us, wasn't of that much value because I told you we're only going to get inches by 2030. But they gave us some three meter sea level data, which was of value because it's about representative of what you might see from storm surges. So we found that very interesting to look at. Now, we then took our outside experts at the Monterey, as I mentioned, we gave them the science scene set, or we got from JCGRI, we gave them the detailed data from season, we gave them uh, state, the uh, extracts from agricultural impacts, and we fed them the IPCC working group too, and they told us what they thought was going to happen. We crafted the document, we've coordinated it inside the intelligence community, and we're now awaiting final review. Okay, um, we uh, are at almost the end game for this document. Uh, we should, uh, we briefed, I'll, I'll let this out, we did brief the DNI last Monday on the document. <laughs> he turned to me and he said, was this fun? <laughs> and I said, yes, it really was. It was kind of an interesting intellectual thing to go do something that you never imagined. And uh, so if it all goes according to our plan, we probably should have this document finished. You may never see it, I said, because of you know, the classification level of it. But I do anticipate you know, some poor victim is going to get, oops, this is taped, isn't it? Um, I do imagine we'll have the opportunity to present this to the Congress. And um, in that venue, uh, one of the national intelligence officers will probably go over there and we'll, certainly in an open session, discuss a lot of it at, at some particular level. So it'll be available to the, public, to the public domain. And with that, I guess I'm ready for your uh, questions. You know, I, I was a fighter pilot, so talking at Mach 1 is allowed. <laughs> Hopefully it was coherent, but all right. Thank you very much. You bet. <clears throat> okay, we'll take some questions. Um, I want to follow up on a couple of themes you talked about. Uh, just because I think even without you becoming more specific, we can make them more concrete for people to understand. You talked a lot about migration, for example. Sure. And you spoke about mig migration within a country, between two countries. And then let's just get concrete in terms of US national security. 
What happens if, let's say, the United Nations hypothetically takes this report that you're about to issue, maybe it's uh, given to the United Nations in some leak, you know, some journalist leaked. gets it, whatever. Uh, the UN gets it and they all vote to say, okay, we're going to have a new category of refugee and they're called climate refugees. People who are escaping Myanmar and sure. have to get out, people who are escaping uh, China, perhaps on the coast or any place else that might be having problems as a result of climate change. And now they raise their hands and they say, I want to come to the United States. I'm a climate refugee. I'm a climate refugee. Does that impose a national security uh, demand upon the United States? Any, or could it? Notwithstanding whether or not there is a climate refugee designation. Okay. Right. Uh, and any, we're not talking about the, your report at this moment. Right, right, now we're right. Just, Anything that would cause a significant migration into the United States beyond what we are normally prepared to handle in the normal course of our business would be a national security issue for the United States, uh, as it would be a national security issue for uh, Europe, would migration to take place out of uh, North Africa, as it might be for China, were migration to come from one part of China to another part of China. So. Migration, if it is kind of within the normal flows that we have accepted over a period of time, is probably something we could take relatively straightforward fashion. If we get significant increases, what does that mean? I can't answer that number because we don't have a good way of wrapping our hands around that. But if we get a significant increase, and if you think about a climate migration where the person really does an opportunity to go back, I mean, they're, they're you know, you're a little talking life and death things because of agricultural water situation they can't go back, uh, then it could become, it doesn't take a lot to imagine it could get hostile. Uh, to the degree that states, and I don't, the United States or any other state, elects to hold these people out, uh, that could be a source of tension to the people who are being held out. And if we, are, we or anyone else are perceived to having done this after we caused, caused the problem, uh, then of course that aggravates the, aggravates the situation. We're already seeing political tension over yeah, in, on a border in, right, between right. the U.S. and Mexico, sure. which is a problem that has developed over decades. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine what would happen if uh, some large number of refugees declared as climate refugees by the U.N. were suddenly to say, we want to come in uh, all at one time. I could imagine the political tensions there, too. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you also mentioned the issue of reputation. I think you said reputation right. is important. And that goes back to the example I gave in the introduction. Uh, a country like Indonesia doesn't really have specific resources that are of a particular value to the United States. I mean, we're not, I don't think, mining anything particular there or whatever. Uh, and yet, there's a country that's, I think, almost 90% Muslim. And if our reputation takes a big hit, if our reputation takes a big hit as a result of the climate change issue, could that become a national security uh, something that requires a national security response? I think any area where our reputation is degraded, um, it has a national security ramification. Indonesia is an interesting case because Indonesia, while you say it doesn't have resources, it does have forests and other areas that the, obviously the climate community is very sensitive to how Indonesia handles those. And, um, and Indonesia has the potential to use those for economic advantage in the negotiations of what happens in the follow-on uh, structures. But yes, reputation does directly translate to national security because reputation relates to your ability to leverage in a geopolitical element one of the elements of national power. If you don't have a good reputation, you can't make your geopolitical power effective and therefore your security is degraded. I guess the point there is even if the United States doesn't have an overt national security interest in a country like, like uh, Indonesia, and there are others that would fit in that category, we're not after oil there, we right. don't have great uh, US business interests and so on active there. Nonetheless, it could pose a demand on our military, a demand on our geopolitical response uh, in the future if climate change becomes an issue for, for that kind of country. Not all, having said that, I would agree with that, but not all humanitarian issues are necessarily national security issues, okay? Um, so it, it does depend upon the unique set of circumstances. Now, if it gets to a place where a humanitarian issue results in a state failure and state failure 
obviously allows uh, harboring of terrorists or something like that, clearly that crosses the national security threshold. State failure that puts at risk a major, or state challenges, may not go all the way to failure, that puts at risk the major economic partner of the United States is a national security issue. State challenges uh, that put at risk access, challenges of failures that put at risk access to a critical resource we count on is a national security issue. So any of those could do that. Now, interesting enough, climate change probably will not, I don't, I'd have to sit back and think about this, but I don't think there's a case of where climate change alone is gonna drive us to one of these situations. What you end up with is a, is a class of states that are in various degree of fragile character and have value to the United States. And climate change, because it affects water, or because it affects agriculture, or because it drives migration, becomes one more thing against this fragile state that's already there and either pushes it into failure or pushes it into some kind of a set of circumstances where it no longer is able to support us. So you cannot look at this as a singular item by itself. You have to step back and look at it almost from a state system's point of view, which is kind of what the GVN argument was saying. Because what you're really dealing with is, is a state that is influenced by many things. And climate change is just one of them that's going to influence. Now, you talked about Canada, and you mentioned the agriculture example right. in Canada. But uh, here's another concrete example. You talked about warming in the Arctic. Uh, we may be in the position of literally seeing unborn waters appear, yeah, right. where ships can suddenly sail from northern Russia to northern Canada, all the way across the Northwest Passage. And the United States has not had to worry about that very much up to now, because you couldn't sail up there. What if Russia and Canada says, say to the United States, Sorry, we've got new water here, new shipping routes, they're all ours. U.S. can't get involved, can't sail your ships there. Not interested, thank you. That would be... Can't, can't, uh, <coughs> can't uh, research for oil up there. Well, I mean, it's more complex. More complicated than that, okay. <laughs> Good. Um, Leave it to the journalist to try to simplify. Right. <laughs> Generally speaking, it would be in Russia's and Canada's interest to facilitate shipping through there because as shipping goes through there and there are uh, ports and other things developed, they get the economic benefit from it. So they wouldn't want to lock it up because that, that doesn't do them any good. They would rather have people go through there so they can get the economic benefit up. There, if there are resources opened up in the Arctic, you really have to take a look at the two cases. And you have two different sets of uh, perspectives. From the Russian perspective, the resources probably will open up first because the way the Arctic is scheduled to kind of warm up, it's the Russian side that opens up first. But Russia doesn't necessarily have the technology to take advantage of it in that very muddy, ugly environment. So they need Western technology to help them do that. At what level will Russia be willing to accept Western technology to help them develop the, uh, the energy? That's, that's obviously a policy question for, for Russia to make. And, they will choose how much they want to do it themselves and how much they want to go to Western uh, countries. On the other side, where the, let's say the ca Canadian and, and Alaskan and U.S. side of this, if resources even became available, we already, in our country, have a great deal of environmental sensitivity to what happens up there. And we might not, we might choose, even though they're there, not to develop them for reasons, for environmental reasons, not necessarily related to their, their value. So as, as we look at the Arctic, uh, yes, new territories will come up. Yes, there's a potential for concentration. But those states really, including the United States, have a very interesting motivation to see it develop constructively because that's where it has the greatest economic value. For their, their interests are not served by getting in a food fight and making everyone run away. Didn't the Russians claim? Oh, yeah, they claimed the, the North Pole. North Pole and the oil, and the oil resources sure, under, the, under the North Pole. But it does it no good to claim it if they don't have the technology to get it out. Okay. Uh, last question before we take questions from the audience. Do any of these situations, these scenarios that you outlined, in your view, have the potential to lead to war? Is it that level? Does climate change have the potential to get to that level of national security challenge? In 2030. Now, again, you have well, to You're go looking out, at 2030. You have okay. to go out to 2030, and the numbers of 2030 are are rather limited. I don't, I won't tell you what our judgment was, 
but I will tell you in the body of information that was presented to us, I don't recall a case of where anyone really suggested war, Milita you know, aggressive military action. The more common scenarios presented to us by people who advised us um, was one of state failures and frustrations and challenges of doing things in interstate conflicts, potentially. And maybe military intervention. Military, if it was an area that was of value to us, but not what I would call classical. I don't think anyone told us in Monterey or when we did these other events that they saw a case of war. I, don't, I just don't recall seeing that. Okay. Your turn. Questions, please. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Okay, physicist asking a question about uncertainty. As you go up this ladder of predictions, starting with what you know and getting to where you want to know, where you want to know about, how do you decide at the top level of the ladder how much uncertainty you have? And I know you've, you've discussed that quite a bit. Right. right. Um, well, engineers and scientists look at uncertainties in different ways. An, an engineer takes the uncertainty and puts a design factor around the end of it and kind of ignores it. Uh, <laughs> and, and Wait a minute, now you're sounding like a journalist. No, I mean, quite <laughs> fr frankly, you know, airplanes are designed with a 1.2 factor of safety. We have a certain statistical distribution of how the aluminum is going to bend. We apply a 1.2 factor of safety. We build the airplane, we fly it. Automobiles with a 1.5. It's these fallible carbon units that are really hard to deal with. Uh, not many Star Trek fans. That's human beings. Their distribution is not like the physical distributions. Their distributions are incredibly wide. So it, very, it becomes very hard to do that. The argument is put forward that, and uh, this was the argument that uh, uh, the CNA paper made, um, Army Chief of Staff made this point, you really need to, in these kind of systems, almost look at it like insurance. In other words, you step back and you admit the uncertainties are too complicated to mathematically wrap your hands around, but you have to make sure you consider the plausible, if not probable, and build a response that accommodates the plausible. Uh, that kind of relieves the engineer of the factor of safety and the scientist of the necessity of precision and the analysts of the complexity of trying to go all the way through those cumulative probabilities, which uh, to, to power, if you know, 80% to the fifth power, it's 0.327 or something like that. Um, that has been suggested as an approach. We can do that, but the challenge for the policy community is they really look at something like that and they kind of say, what are you trying to tell me? You know, I mean, it's really hard for for a policy community that wants actionable intelligence to accept sometimes the insurance argument. It's, it's just too uh, hard for them to wrap their hands around, particularly their focus is short term and they have other issues on, on their plate. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to keep ourselves within the state of the plausible and build a story that is sufficiently uh, credible so that if they do craft their response, whatever they may choose to do, and that's a question for the policy community to do it, a response they could craft would be robust enough that it would handle multiple different types of actual manifestations. And that's a classic Department of Defense response to any crisis. I don't know exactly what I'm gonna need this weapon system for, but I do know I need to have a class of problems for which I can apply the weapon system. 
if you were to ask the designers of the B-52 if they would be dropping GPS-guided bombs in Afghanistan with laser designators from CIA agents, they would tell you you're nuts. But yet, when it came time to go do that, we did that. And that's, that's, a, that's an argument for looking at the plausible and crafting a policy that recognizes the plausible rec with the understanding that when it comes time to execution, the specifics may not be what you thought of. Isn't this partly the same problem the CIA and other intelligence agencies face all the time? Policy makers who are elected every four years or every six years or every two years want to know what to do sure. now. Sure. And your job is not to tell them what to do. Your job is to tell them, here's what the problem is or here's what the problem looks like it might be. And not only that, uh, they want to know where to spend their money. Well, we try very hard. Where to spend your money. Right. We, we try very hard to not be policy prescriptive. I mean, that is in our charter. So we, we don't go as far as telling them what to do. We try and describe to them the class of problems we think they're going to face. And then you know, it's, it's to them and the experts around them to craft the specific responses. And this is a, this is a case. Global climate change is a case of where it's, it's complicated because it's not a singular issue. It's not a singular variable. It's part of this broader state stability that has many different moving pieces. It's farther out in the future, so it's hard for them to wrap their heads around because it's well beyond their election cycle. But nonetheless, it's something they know they need to deal with. And for all those reasons, uh, it just becomes a very hard problem for them to deal with. Our job is just to give them the best possible vision so they can craft a near-term policy that is responsive. OK. Question from a student. Yes. We have a separate topic that deals with energy. Yes. All right, the questioner is asking, everybody can't hear the question. So, uh, the questioner is asking whether, uh, noting that your analysis of national security issues excluded the question of energy security and energy generally, uh, are you looking at that? Did you include it in this report? Are you looking at it in other ways and how? All right, so could competition over those energy resources in the same way that I asked about competition over uh, climate issues be a, a source of conflict? I don't know if you're equipped to answer either of those uh, questions, well, authorized to do so. Let me, let, me, let me get to the national intelligence priorities framework, as I said, at 20 topics. One of the topics is, engine, is energy security, OK? So it's considered in its own separate category. None of these topics are considered in isolation of the other topics. When we look at an energy security issue, we consider uh, the technology issue is part of it, okay? So th the short answer to the energy one is yes, the community looks at that. Obviously, that's incredibly important for the United States, and we are very sensitive to energy sources and the energy sources that may potentially be at risk. That's what the intelligence community does. As to your question of a specific technology, we also have a topic that deals with emerging potentially disruptive technologies. And as I explained earlier, we just got through writing a, pa a contract paper written to us, looked at potentially emerging disruptive technologies, and it considered uh, three energy technologies in the paper, which we just uh, recently, uh, our contractor just recently put on our website. So yes, we look at technologies in that context in the, in the, um, through the topic of emerging potentially disruptive technologies. Now, would we have wars because of energy? <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to go there. <laughs> what do you mean by emerging disruptive technologies? Um, we've defined emerging disruptive technology as a technology that provides a unique opportunity or threat to the United States, either one, which is interesting. Most of the time we talk about threats. This one is opportunity or threats, that if the technology were to be matured, it would significantly advance or degrade one of the elements of national power. <coughs> So in other words, it's a technology where it to be developed would either be significant advantage or disadvantage to the United States. Um, and it's either an opportunity or a challenge. Give that's, us an example it. of one just so we can put it in our heads. Oh, well, uh, the one that uh, oh, we identified in this report was uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, and here's the upside to carbon capture and sequestration. If we can do it, 
if it really works well. The United States has huge coal reserves, and uh, it gives us the potential to free our dependence on, on oil, uh, avoid climate problems, and at the same time use a natural resources that's close to our border. That's the upside. If, if, we, if we get, if you, according to this document, if you read, if you, what it says is if we get into carbon capture and sequestration, we commit to it as our answer, and it doesn't work, oh boy. Ooh, and we have a real challenge. We have to then to make a very quick turn to something else. Probably the only thing that would be available would be nuclear, and that would be hard to do because of the technical problems. It would be hard to do uh, because of the potential uh, uh, proliferation issues around the world. You know, what would it do if we it would make uh, non-proliferation a very challenging thing to go do? So that's kind of the downside. So we looked at carbon capture and sequestration as a potentially emerging disruptive technology. The other one was batteries, uh, a breakthrough that would allow us to have significant improvements in energy storage, allows us to put our surface transportation off the off vehicles and onto the grid so we could use grid-based power for it. We could get more efficiency out of our renewables because we could hold the energy from our renewables and then bleed it back. We could use load leveling so we could uh, uh, better balance our energy consumption uh, and operate our most efficient facilities at higher utilization rates 24-7. Uh, for all those reasons, batteries are a huge uh, advantage to us if we could, if we could pull, that, pull that off. And the third one was biofuels particularly a generation two or three biofuel that wouldn't obviously compete with food sources. Uh, the advantage of biofuels, if we can pull that off quickly, is a lot of our existing uh, petrochemical-based infrastructure could handle some biodiesels. Can't handle ethanol, but it could handle biodiesels. So we could do a lot without having to recapitalize our infrastructure, assuming we could get that, uh, get that to work. So uh, a very efficient biofuel would be great. Uh, by the way, if you want to bet, bet on algae. Algae? That's a freebie, bet on algae. Okay, we actually had another speaker talk about did that. Did he really? We did indeed. Okay, question from a non-student. Yes? Uh, your, your report generally seems, if I understand it correctly, to be in two things correct if I'm wrong. Uh, one is that gradually is the major change that took place. Uh, and am I correct in that? Okay. 2-2030, we base the report on a mid-range IPCC scenario, and that scenario, actually, it turns out if you look at all the scenarios to 2030, they don't change a lot. There's not, they're not the variation that close in. It really happens afterwards. And we, uh, I would, I, it's a fair discussion to say we talked about it in terms of gradualism. I will say we did spend, and I talked about it on the slides, because other people told us it was important, we did tell the policy community there are these things that could make this not gradual. And we kind of explained to them what they could be. But the okay. analytical thrust is based upon OK, so what's your question? Gradual. Okay, the question is, if the climate change models primarily talk in terms of heat, uh, sh does that mean that you would recommend building storm walls around cities like New Orleans and, for that matter, the coast of Delaware? New York. Uh, New York. <clears throat> okay, we are not in the policy prescription business, okay? But if you, I think if you looked, I mean, I'll, I'll say this, and it's just my opinion. You could ask other people who've looked at the IPCC data. But I think if you looked at the IPCC data, you would generally not draw the conclusion out to 2030. The type of change you're going to see with a gradual change would warrant that. What it would warrant doing is obviously if you take the further view out to 2100, you have to start thinking about this infrastructure and you need to kind of wrap your head around the idea that your infrastructure design criteria today may not be credible for what you face in the future. So you have to revisit your infrastructure design criteria. How much you revisit it, that kind of depends upon which scenario you take and whether or not you believe you're going to see something that's a departure from a gradual 
gradual change. What you mean by that is, do you build all your houses on pilings, or do you build any on the ground? Do you build your roads of certain? Right. Of certain Everything that you look in. Sewer the, pipes that sewer, are underground. Sewer pipes, where you protect water against supply. storms, water supply, where do you run your electrical power underground to make it less vulnerable to trees knocking it over. The whole way, you, by the way, and one of the interesting freebies out of this, if you redesign your infrastructure to make it more robust for weather events, guess what else it's more robust against? Terrorist attacks. So th there is kind of this you know, intersection of, of some classes of activities that you can do that, that are attractive not only from a climate change point of view, but attractive from other national security points of view. If you make your infrastructure, and this is a little bit harder to do, but if you found the, the perfect global climate change response that allowed you to decentralize your power generation, that decentralized power generation is good from a climate point of view, for example, photovoltaic cells with good batteries, but it's also good from a, a storm. It's a good adaptation because now you have a bunch of small places generating power. It's less likely you're going to have the whole system go down. And if you have a terrorist attack go against one thing, it's like trying to take the internet down. It's harder to do because you've got multiple nodes around to do it. So if you're, if you're we're not in the policy business, but if you step back and you look at this, you say, that may be kind of a sweet spot. Where can I find the combination of things that I can do that are effective both from a global climate change point of view and have a, a broader national security uh, benefit at the same time? One of the uh, writers on this topic talked about no regrets policies. Right, right, right. Uh, and I think that fits in that category. That is, things you might do that seem good for other reasons, or perhaps would be good for other reasons, but also would benefit. I think. What, what often is talked about in that context is efficiencies. For example, to the degree you pursue things that make your economy more efficient, that is a no regrets policy. Because even if all of a sudden climate change is not an issue, if I'm co consuming 30, 40% less electricity because I've made my economy more efficient, I'm more competitive in the global stage. Or if I do something that reduces my dependency being upon an unstable source of energy, Notwithstanding the fact the climate does not change in the future, I have an advantage because I've, I've increased my security because I'm not as dependent. <laughs> What's the good example of that? LED light bulbs, okay? Funny little simple thing, LED light bulbs. Everyone changes to LED light bulbs. And if, you, if we did that, and I'm not, I'm not policy prescription, but <laughs> got to say that. Uh, that's the kind of thing that it improved the efficiency of the economy it, it can be constructive whether or not the climate changes or not. That's a no regrets kind of decision. Okay. Question from a student. Yes, sir. Um, you highlighted the economy and said no national power. Correct. Um, and I was just wondering your opinion on whether the No, never in a thousand uh, years would I answer that question. I have okay. no opinion Wait, on the Hang on. The qu so the question is, you can say you don't answer it if you want to. The question is, uh, since you highlighted the economy, what's your opinion of Congress's decision to yeah, ban right. drilling in, the, uh, in Anwar and other uh, areas? That's a policy choice that the Congress has made. And you know, intelligence community doesn't comment on the policy choices that people make. I mean, that's not our job. Our job is to tell them what the challenges are, and they make those choices, and we just don't, we just try to very much avoid that. Well, we don't, we don't do that. Okay, question from a non-student? Yes, sir. Okay, a, a okay. question is, uh, is your report based yep. on the assumption that after you tell them what the problems are, the government's actually gonna do something? they listen to us? Of course they listen to us. It turns out by going to 2030, uh, most of the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere is probably already on its way to 2030. And what, therefore, what we said is not very dependent upon what we do between now and 2030. The predictions are still probably would still be accurate. So the short answer to your question is it doesn't make that much difference because the momentum is already in the in the atmosphere, according to the scientific uh, community. It would make a huge difference beyond that. 
And by the way, that's one of the reasons why we stopped at 2030. The IPCC has as its core assumption that the world takes no action to mitigate uh, the impacts of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that we continue to develop essentially on the path we've been developing with the existing technologies. And then the, the scenarios they use are a combination of economic and social development scenarios, again, with this relatively constant assumption of, of technology and adaptation. I personally don't think that's the world in front of us. I think we are going to adapt. I think the reason that you've got me here talking about this is people think this is an issue worth dealing with. So we didn't want to go too far out into the future because it, how do you weave that in? How much of an adaption are we going to do? What kind of technology breakthrough are we going to see? It turns out, as I said, the 2030, because of the momentum, it probably doesn't make a lot of difference. But if you asked me to write this at 2070, I would have to, I couldn't do it with a single answer. I guess that's a good way. If you asked me to write this to 2070, I have to give you a kind of a scenario-based approach, uh, which is good. We do that often in the intelligence community. We'll write that way. But we didn't write this particular report that way. Question from a student. Yes. All right, I th I'm going to try to paraphrase this, but correct me if I've got it wrong. Uh, you talked about the U.S. going into countries where uh, the U.S. sees a strong American national security interest, but essentially ignoring places where the U.S. doesn't see such an immediate interest. Wouldn't that anger people who are inclined to terrorism? And, uh, and what's your comment on that? Did I get it approximately yeah. right? Yeah, I okay. There is always going to be a, what one might call a secondary or tertiary effect of not reacting to a humanitarian disaster. I think the United States, because we are a global country, because we are wealthy, generally speaking, we try to react to all of them. And I'm less worried about our not reacting. I think the question is less related to our non-reacting to a humanitarian issue, which we generally will engage in all of them at some level. The issue more gets into these other areas where our reaction would have to not be humanitarian, but be military. And if we see genocide someplace around the world that doesn't necessarily, in a region where we, we deem we have a direct interest, are we obligated to go in and stop it? Are we obligated as one sovereign state to enter with military power into another sovereign state because the occupier of that state is behaving like a jerk? Well, that's obviously an incredibly sensitive question that we have to approach very, very carefully. Uh, and sometimes we approach it carefully and sometimes we don't. I won't critique one way or another, but I think I'm, not, I'm less worried about that happening because we don't engage humanitarian-wise, because I think we'll do that anyway. I'm, I think the question is more an in, more interesting question when we decline to go in militarily. And I just say that's really complicated. You know, along those lines, something you said in the class earlier today I think is worth repeating here. You talked about the demands on the U.S. military right. and uh, all of the infrastructure the military encompasses, transportation, communication, coordination, command and control, and all that. Uh, if the U.S. starts to react to climate change demands using its military as the tool for intervention, that could drain attention, support, uh, finances, and so on from other areas of national security interest. Well, that, that was one of the observations from the CNA report, the Center for Naval Analysis report, I mean, from these retired military officers, is that if the scope of the humanitarian operations gets larger and larger because of climate change, and if we do respond like we have historically responded, and the military is our first element of response because it brings inherent advantages when it responds, you, you can end up with an overstretched, not combat power, but you end up with an overstretched combat support and combat service support can be overstretched, and if that then can degrade your ability to support combat operations. That's an issue that, again, you know, we don't tell the policy community how to deal with that. They have to think through what, what that means and 
how do they want, how potentially do they want to look at the force structure? Do they change the force structure? Do they count on other partners? Do they provide money to other countries to be able to go do that? So our combat, our combat support and combat service support is not burdened. That's a policy question. Okay, question from a non-student. Non-student, question from a student. Oh, go ahead. Questioner is asking, asking about uh, the fact that you've talked about humanitarian yeah. threats and national security threats, asking basically how do you decide which is which? Is there a, a hard and fast metric for that, or is it a subjective choice made by politicians at any given moment? No, a humanitarian threat can be a national security. A humanitarian issue can be a national security, and it cannot be a national security. I, I think we would go back. I mean, I would give you the cold calculating definition that we used in the report, and that is, it's a national security issue when, if not satisfactorily resolved, it would degrade one of the elements of national power to at least the temporary, temporary but noticeable degradation of one of the elements of national power. Now, in that definition, we also talked about some paths of how that might happen. It might happen because it directly hits the U.S. homeland. It might happen because it hits a major economic ally, a major military ally or it might happen because the scope of the operation gets so large it degrades our, our, our military. Are those subjective? Yes, they, they are subjective. Interestingly enough, as I said, the United States generally will respond, I don't know of a humanitarian crisis like a, where we don't respond. I think most of them we try to respond to the extent we can. Um, some of them, obviously, are more important from a national security point of view, but our general response so far has been to try and respond to all of them, to my knowledge. I'd have to go back and think about that. Question from a non-student? Yes, sir. We don't present policy actions. Yeah. We present yeah. problems. Well, we try not to present policy options. We try to present problems and let the, let the policy community figure out what options it wants to go do. Well, so the, the questioner is asking, so what? So, so what to who? So what to? All right, let me just paraphrase that. The question is basically saying, if we really need to get to a 20% reduction in greenhouse gases. I'm sorry? Well, you said 20%, but it's all right. Um, an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases. What is it that's going to cause the nation to actually uh, go f make that change, make that big policy and, and lifestyle change? Do we need another 9-11 on not, the climate change? Not how we're going to do it, but, what, but what's going to cause gonna it? Cause what's going to prompt it? It isn't going to be your report, or is it? No, it would not be our report. <laughs> I mean, does, because, it, does there have a, to be a crisis? Hey, we're going to 2030, and uh, we don't say anything that would. Well, we do change. We do say something we think would uh, encourage the policy community to deal with the issue. Whether or not is that an 80 percent deal with it, or they deal with it 10 percent. That's a policy question. We, we, don't, we won't get into that. Um, I mean, the essence of your question is a domestic political question. What would motiv motivate our political leadership to make a decision? The intelligence community does not look at our political leadership. 
I, I don't have an answer to that question. Okay. I'm afraid Maybe we're... Maybe a personal opinion, but that's it. I'm afraid we're out of uh, time. And before we thank General Engel for his uh, remarks tonight, I want to just uh, offer a farewell note. This is the final Global Agenda program for this spring, so you can have your Wednesday nights back again. Um, but if you want to receive email notices about programs like this next year, be sure to put your email address, print clearly, please, on one of those orange sheets out in the lobby on your way out this evening. Now let's thank Richard Engel, General Engel, for being with us tonight here at the University.